All right, great. How's everybody doing? Great. I was going to start out with a fire alarm joke, but I realized that it's probably quite overused, and you know, so I'm not going to go there today. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, at the nine o'clock session had uh, a little bit of a scare, and I feel really bad for the speakers there. Um, but anyways, we, I think the organizers were really good, and they, we made up for a lot of that towards the end of the day. All right, so I, um, by way of introduction, my name is Abe Thomas. I work at Microsoft, and I have responsibility for uh, Microsoft.com, the, the, the website. So that includes all the product, the SEO, the design, the, uh, the, the Marcom, the publishing, the analytics related to a certain set of sites um, that we call, that are within the Microsoft.com domain. Um, I don't actively manage things like Bing and MSN and Live.com, even though we, pl we do play an influence role there. Um, and, and by the way, for those of you who are um, just walking in and trying to figure out, is this the right presentation or not, um, there were two titles to this. There was one that was, that was actually online, which is to do with multi-device experience and the responsive web. And the other one has to do with, uh, which was, I believe, in your written pamphlets, had to do with um, how to make sense of all the marketing. So the way for me to get maximum participation is for me to say it's about both, right? But uh, uh, I will say it is a little bit about both, because my presentation did evolve. It was about the Uber mar marketing topic, but it has evolved, and it's become a little bit more a um, case study towards the multi-device problem that we have today. A lot of us in, in the web community have today, and how Microsoft has done has dealt with that using the responsive web architecture. Uh, but I will talk about the broader marketing problem as well. Um, so you know, that's a little bit about uh, what I do at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for a couple of years now. I came from a, a slew of other companies in the Bay Area, MySpace, eBay, AltaVista, Palm, and just a bunch of different things. Um, I've been in the internet marketing or the online marketing space for a long, long time now. Um, even though I have my roots as a developer, uh, a software developer writing code for cell phones. Um, but I do want to get a sense for um, how many people here are work for a startup? Just to get a show of hands. Okay. How many people work for agencies? Wow, that's a lot of people working for agencies. And then uh, how many people are just doing some kind of work related to, de to design? To the design discipline. OK. This is, so this is all great. This is going to be very, very relevant for all three of you populations. Um, so uh, to give you a little bit more context, uh, Microsoft.com is the eighth most visited website in the, in the world today. Um, and uh, uh, this is not including MSN, Live.com, and, and Bing. If we were, we would be the second largest website or the, the collection of websites um, after Google. And um, you know, the mission or the vision I have at Microsoft.com, I like to think is a pretty lofty one, but um, I can connect with every single word on this vision. And the vision is to inspire people worldwide to love Microsoft through compelling online experiences. So when you think of these, these are very, very carefully crafted 11 words. I can guarantee you there's a lot of debate that my team and I went through in deciding on these 11 words. And they're very uh, intentional, and they're very powerful, too. The words inspire, the word love, the word compelling. These are very, very carefully chosen words. And, and, they're, and, the, and the point is to do exactly that through the experiences that we create online. As a company, you may or may not have uh, know about this, but you know, there's been a lot of press about us uh, of late. Um, but we are moving into an era of devices and services. So you know, you're, you're seeing... You're, Traditionally, you may have gone into a store and bought one of our products, like an office product, where you're going to increasingly see more and more of our users going online to use the services that we're coming up with, whether it's Skype, whether it's Yammer, whether it's Office even, obviously Xbox or any of the gaming opportunities that you have. So it's all the more important that we create a really, really compelling online experience for our users. And this is not something, to be completely honest, that Microsoft's really known for, is really good at. We're really good at productivity software, as we know from you know, Office and, and you know, coming up with operating systems. But you know, compelling online experiences is, is not something that we're terribly great at. So um, before I start talking about um, 
you know, the bulk of my presentation is going to be about the multi-device experience problem. But before I start talking about that, I thought I would just share with you a little bit of you know, what I call old world problems and then new world problems. So when I think of the old world problems, I mean, and this still hits us today. It's not that old. But you are out there as a consumer, and you are exposed to all these mediums and formats, whether it's a TV, whether it's print, whether it's email, whether it's search. And you're just getting you know, blasted by all of these messages. And they're just, just, all these marketers are just hitting you and saying, do this, do that, buy this, buy that. And it's, it, it's kind of like when my wife asked me to go to a grocery store and asked me to buy salad dressing. And I'm looking at those six rows of salad dressing, and I'm like, uh, what do I do? And you just get numb. And that's often what's happening with, uh, with all the marketing messages happening out there. And then from a marketer standpoint, we're having a hard time deciding as to which channel really contributed to that final sale. Was it that million dollar Super Bowl ad that we bought, or was it that 15 cent CPC ad that we got on, uh, on, on Google that really uh, drove that, you know, that last click and then ended up having the user buy that product? It's really hard. And so you've got problems that are, um, have existed for decades and decades that are just going to keep on going. But there are new world problems, and one of the ones that we've heard a lot of had a lot of conversation on the last couple of days has been around social. And you know, social is not a new that new of a problem, but it's been around for a few years now, and there's just a lot of noise around social. And you know, what does it mean to have you know when you run a viral campaign and for you to have 100,000 you know uh, followers or, or likes or what have you? I mean, how does that really translate to? actual transactions taking place. Not to mention now, what's, what's really uh, nuanced now is the quality of social. So you've got friends that really like it, and then you've got friends that really don't like it. And then what do you do as a consumer? Do you buy the product? Do you not? And it's not consistent. Sometimes you rely on that one friend's opinion when you're buying a product, but you don't on, on some other product. So this is, there are a lot of new listening tools that are coming up that are actually improving the situation quite a bit. But it's still, it's still a pretty big problem out there. It's slowly maturing, but it's going to take a little bit longer. And then you know, the one other problem that is increasingly uh, becoming an issue is the multi-device experience problem. And what does that really mean? I mean, you, you are now, um, uh, as a consumer, you're wanting more and more interaction with the specific device that's in front of you. you know, how, many, how many people attended David Shing's uh, presentation yesterday? The AOL presentation, which I thought was a phenomenal presentation, by the way. I, I would love to have a title as Digital Profit. Actually, anything profit would be great. The guy's a great presenter. Um, but you know, he kind of alluded to this, too, this lean in, what do you call it? Lean in, lean back, lean in. You know, like you're actually you're getting immersed in some set of experiences depending on the device that you're on. And, and this is actually going to get worse. So, let me ask you, let me do a poll here. How many of you, and I won't be offended by the answer, honestly, I won't be, but how many of you have an iPad? Ah, not bad. That's a, that's a pretty large number of people. How many of you have an Android phone? And then uh, how many of you have a Windows PC that you use? OK. So I, I, I probably should have asked you know, how many of people who have an iPad also have an Android and have a Windows phone. The point is, that you are on multiple uh, platforms, multiple ecosystems, and this is going to become more and more of a problem as you take on, you know, you have one set of apps that you have in your Android phone versus another one that you have in your iPad versus another one that you have in your Windows 8 machines. Um, and, you know, you're seeing a mad scramble amongst all of us guys, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon. And by the way, you may be on a different cloud services completely like Amazon's. Um, you, you're increasingly seeing a lot of us kind of come in front of you as a consumer and say, we've got it all knit together. We've got the integrated suite of services as well as hardware to go with, um, with what your experiences should be. Um, you know, 60% of all iPad users are actually, and this is a fact, um, are actually have an Android phone. So that just goes to show that you know, people are, are, um, have a very fragmented set of experiences happening today. Right now, it's, it's tolerable. It's OK, because everybody's just learning new things, learning new apps. They're just getting glamorized by it. But pretty soon, you're going to hit us up and say, not, not, not good enough, guys. Microsoft, Apple, get it together. We need to have one single thing. Tell us what to do. 
So this is to show you a little bit of how um, users are using multiple devices today. So PC growth, you can see what's been happening over the last few years. Uh, smartphones obviously have gone up quite a bit, and then tablets are, are going up at a much faster rate too. And then this is what's going to happen in a few years. Tablets, the growth for them is just going to exponentially grow. Um, smartphones are just going to keep on growing at this rate, and then PCs are obviously going to be a little bit more of a mature industry. So this, this problem becomes uh, uh, a bigger and bigger, and today I think it's like 17 minutes every day are spent on your phone, 30 minutes on your tablet, 39 minutes on your PC, and I bet that's going to change quite a bit. It's probably going to get a little bit more flipped. So I, I thought I would talk about what Microsoft is doing to address this multi-device problem from a website design. So there's multiple issues going on here with uh, uh, multiple devices. One is, you know, are you on the same app e ecosystem, which is not something I'm going to actually address. That's a completely different problem. I am going to talk about the responsive web and how Microsoft arrived at a, a responsive web architecture for its home page. And, um, and that's going to sound, it's a little bit of a new topic for a lot of people in website design. So I thought I would explain to you what responsive web is all about. So this is just one of the early examples from Smashing Magazine on how they've set up their website on uh, responsive web. So this is what the desktop view looks like. This is what the, the tablet view looks like. And this is what the phone view looks like. Now, if you're not on the responsive web architecture, what's going to happen on your smartphone is you're going to be pinching in and out on your smartphone just to read the, the darn article. But here, the layout just accommodates, the, the, the format of the page just accommodates to the device you're, you're, uh, you're on. And it does that in a very automatic way. So we were obviously very, very intrigued by that, and we wanted to actually do that for, um, for on Microsoft.com. So how do we arrive at that? So there are these seven guiding principles that we use at uh, Microsoft for all of our marketing. This is, this is what we started uh, looking at to, to arrive at the responsive web design. The first one is live and breathe the, the, the customer journey. So, you know, I'll talk about this in a lot more detail in the ne next few slides, but you know, when I think about this, I think about my time at uh, eBay when I was uh, doing a lot of SEM and SEO back then. And you know, we were just fanatical about data and analytics. I mean, the, the uh, online marketing team that I was a part of was around four people when I joined. It grew to about 98 people by the time I left. And most of them, a lot of them, were like PhD statisticians. It's because we were so, so fixated on data and see what people wanted, were doing. So really understanding what users want and how they're interacting with the website is really key. For example, we would find that on eBay, we would find you know, people would type in Beanie Babies, which is you know, a very classic eBay uh, keyword. But they would end up buying a, you know, a $50,000, $100,000 classic car which is very, very unusual. And, and we didn't know why that was happening, so we would have to look at a lot of the flow analysis. And we found, and we actually, it was an interesting finding, because we actually found that, that, you know, while most of the people in the two coasts didn't spend that much time on eBay, they were very transaction-oriented, most of middle America actually spent a lot of time on eBay, up to eight hours, because they were constantly finding arbitrage opportunities to buy and then sell on the marketplace. And, and in that, we found that there were these kind of random kind of purchases being made because of arbitrage opportunities that were being found. So people looking, coming in, looking for Beanie Babies, found a really good deal on a classic car, only to then resell that classic car a few days later. So understanding what consumers want is super key. Knowing and respecting the competition. So, um, you know, I, 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 I remember when I was at Alta Vista and, you know, Google was coming up. This is obviously pre-IPO -Google, pre Google. And at first it was a, yeah, it's a search engine, but we've been there. We, we you know, we know what to do to crawl the web really effectively, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then they just took over. It was just the most humbling type of situation that you can have. Same thing happened to me when I was at MySpace with Facebook. Um, and, you know, we just didn't know what to, to do. And I had a really hard job at MySpace because, you know, my job was to bring in users. And how do you do that when you've got this giant call Facebook that is just gobbling away all these users? But so, so knowing and respecting the competition is super important. Um, romancing our product truth. So this is something I can comfortably say all of us in the room have learned from Apple really, really well. 
boy, do they know how to romance their, their products. And they don't, it, it feels like they're not trying very hard, but the simplistic, minimalistic design, the product design, even the website design, has got to be something that we all want to emulate. And, and we've all learned from those guys there. Even though it, it, uh, of late, I have to say, you know, it's, not, it's resulting in a lot of reorgs, but let's not go there. Um, all right, um, plan the work, work the plan. Boy, that sounds so simple. It, it really does. And, and, you know, when I attend these kinds of conferences, I'm always, uh, I, I, I have an interesting, I, I hear a lot of you in the audience talking about um, viral and, and having campaigns go viral and then just, just you know, going and flowing with it. And it's so hard for me to um, fully appreciate that because I've come from slightly bigger companies, especially the one that I'm at. And when you're spending tens of millions of dollars in marketing, it's hard to kind of just do some kind of ad hoc marketing. So I, 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 I get the, uh, the value of letting a campaign just run amok, awfully, especially on social, and just see where it takes you. But at the same time, you have to have a plan. You have to know that all of these different messages that you are pushing out through all these different mediums are going to land in a very, with a very consistent message. And that's what uh, plan the work is. And the work, the plan piece, often gets ignored. Because you, know, you come in and you put the plan together, but somebody's got to do the heavy lifting, right? So, so working the plan is really important, too. Um, throw fewer pebbles, make bigger waves. Again, very commonsensical, but uh, uh, Microsoft is just, uh, uh, I think, has been terrible at that in, in, in the last several years, but I think it's getting much, much better. You know, you're, you're seeing us not just jamming our products to all of our customers. Now we're a lot more surgical about what, customer, what products we show to what customers and at what time. So um, even with this, uh, uh, you know, all of the launches that we've had of late, whether it's around Windows Phone 8 or Windows 8 or even the Surface, it's been very, very well thought out this, as to the timing for that. But we've done it in a way where it's not like just pushing it all out there. We've just been very careful about making you know, enough noise and then pausing and making a lot more noise uh, for something else. Disclosure drives action. So you know, all of you, you know, who are at startups, especially these stealth startups, can appreciate this. I mean, if you're going to disclose something to the broader public, you have to have it lead to a particular action. If you're just doing it to show off, boy, that's a big mistake. And that's true for a stealth startup. It's also true for what we do in big companies as well. Um, take, for example, our, our decision to announce the surface, uh, uh, you know, back, I think it was in June, July time frame or even Windows 8 back in the build conference last year. It was very, very, uh, it, there was a certain action we wanted. We wanted developers to sign up and have them write applications, which is why we started talking about Windows 8 that far back. And then the last, which is also one of my favorites, you know, which is popularized by Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is going to be, not, uh, not where it is right now. Because you will never, you'll always play catch up if you're always going to be um, uh, going where the puck is right now, as opposed to going to where it should be. So let me dive into this in a little bit more detail. So living in, and breathing the, the customer journey. So three phases that we think that we have, uh, that we at Microsoft have called out as part of the customer journey. The first is learn and evaluate, select and, uh, and then select and buy, and then use and advocate. So, all customers come to our website, in, and they're almost always in one of these three phases. And for us, we spent a lot of time understanding our analytics on our, on our website to know why they came. First of all, who were they? Were they an IT pro or IT decision maker? Were they a developer? Were they a consumer? Were they an enterprise customer? Why, so who are they, and why are they there? And then we also run a bunch of surveys to understand um, you know, to sort of further our understanding of why they might have come there. So I would highly, I know this is, this is probably something a lot of you already do, but for the websites that you have, to understand who is, who, why people are coming there and, and what are the actions that they are taking is sort of step zero. But, in, but to kind of follow up on what Steve Jobs has kind of taught us over time, I think you can't just fixate on that. You also have to think about the... The, the, the solutions or the value propositions that our users are interested in but we're not offering today. 
So understanding the customer journey is something that we did with our website. And then knowing and understanding the competition. So, and, and I have competition in quotes. And so when you see Starbucks, we are not competing with them. We are not getting into the coffee business, I assure you. And we are also not getting into the journalism business, I assure you there. So why do I have that called that as competition? Um, Apple certainly is. I mean, I think when you look at what they do with their website design, very simple, very minimalistic. They use video very effectively. Uh, Dropbox is another uh, competitor you, you know, uh, to our SkyDrive product, very simple as well, very clean interface. A lot of smaller companies have this kind of an approach of having very simple, clean interfaces, even Netflix. And then Starbucks and Glo uh, the Boston Globe are actually two sites that are into the responsive web. They were the, there were several sites now that are popping up, but they were the two fir uh, the early ones, along with Smashing Magazine, who actually um, understood what the um, um, responsive web was all about. So we looked at them quite carefully and tried to understand you know, what, what a user goes through when they actually are, are on a phone versus a tablet versus a, um, a desktop. And then romancing our product truths. I'll just pause for a second while you view this video. It doesn't actually have audio, but. So this is something we actually have running today on our homepage for uh, all the countries that we don't have Surface, where we're not selling Surface. And it's a 12-second video, very short, very clean. It doesn't actually have video. I mean, it doesn't have audio. Um, but it's, it's increasingly a format, and you probably picked up on this over the last day as well. It's increasingly a format that is turning out to be very, very effective in, in uh, companies communicating with their customers. And we've just grokked onto this. We've actually seen very, very good results from using video on the home page. Um, and, 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 and it's not something that we've done traditionally, uh, because we've just stuck to more uh, traditional ways of communicating to our customers. But this is turning out to be a, a really effective method. But not just that. It's, it's keeping your design simple, clean. We, we get, when you think about um, Microsoft, we have more than a billion customers um, who have Microsoft products. But really, how, can you, how do you cater to all of them? It's nearly impossible to cater to all of them. You just have to do what you can to help them navigate through the website. So the, the home page in particular, which is the front door to our entire set of mic our, for a, a user's Microsoft experiences, we have to make sure that it's super clean. And it just allows users to connect in a very emotional way with Microsoft, which goes back to my vision statement earlier about loving Microsoft. And it starts with experiences like this. Plan the work, work the plan. We did a, a, a heck of a lot of testing, I'll, I'll tell you that, when, we, um, when arriving at our new homepage design. So this is just an early, early version of something that we, uh, early testing that we played around with. This was the control layout that we had. And then this was um, a, a new variation that we introduced. You'll see a little bit of a difference with what we call the feature panel, the hero unit. We've changed um, the, the audience pivots as well. You see those four colors in the, in the control layout on, on, the, on the right. It's for home users, for work users, for uh, IT pros and developers, I believe, are the other two tabs. Um, but we simplified that. And so now on the right, we only have it for uh, work users and then home users. And, and we've cleaned it up a little bit more. So we saw an improvement of 7.22% in click-through rate. There was another variation we, we launched. And this was a completely different design as well. It had this fat footer. Um, we introduced this thing called a fat footer, which is what you see on the bottom there, which, which by the way, is increasingly becoming um, a common feature in a lot of leading websites. Um, we saw some improvement there in click-through rate, um, but not quite as good as the first one. And then you have a third variation that we introduced, um, and that saw an improvement as well. And obviously, the winner was that variation B. Um, but you know, even in the testing that we did, we didn't actually take that one page in its entirety and say, OK, well, that's going to be our new design. We took components off that and concluded that this component, even though it's on variant D, is actually performing really well. So we're going to take that and slap it onto the things that are working on variant B. And for, for that to happen, you need you know, two or three things. One, you have to have the right tools and infrastructures, uh, whether it's a third party uh, web trends like functionality that you're using. And two, you need to have the analytics horsepower inside the house 
to kind of um, understand the numbers that are coming through because there are these very, very subtle things that are happening even when you may conclude that the 7.22 without a doubt is a winner, but it's not that different from a 7.01. Does it deserve to be the clear winner? And maybe if you ran the test again in a different environment, you would get a different set of numbers. So we actually took the best of all of these worlds, but the, but the point was we had a plan. We didn't just come up with a new website. We had a plan and we worked that plan. Throw fewer pebbles, bigger waves. This is a version of the homepage from 2010. And um, you can't probably see this very clearly, but those, those things that you see on the left, those are meant for each of the audiences. So what you see there, what's highlighted right now is what's called highlights. But there's one for IT pros, one for developers, and one for two or three other things. And each one of those tabs goes into a, a slew of different topics. And it's so confusing for an average user to kind of um, make any sense of this that they often don't even go to the other tabs. Not to mention, the, the worst part about this page probably was the, the, the fact that if you go to the main nav, that was a carbon copy of our org chart. And I don't mean literally our org chart, but when you saw the slew of products that we have under Windows, it was almost like how we were organized. You would see SharePoint on there having its own set of products. You would see, you know, it was just, it was a little, it was, I think we, at some point we had like 156 links in just the main nav. So it was just a, a monstrosity and it was just a pain for our users to actually deal with. So we made it simpler last year, not quite fully there. And, um, you know, we had two pivots for work and for home, and you could click on that and you would get to a completely different page. You still see a little bit of clutter, especially on top products. There's like three or four of those main links, and then, you know, they, they kind of rotate out. So it's not super clean. And then obviously, just last month, actually this month formally, October 1, um, uh, to get ready for the uh, Windows 8 launch, we launched this new home page. So much cleaner. The search box is. You know, it doesn't have any Bing branding on there. We've got a main nav that's plain and simple. Even if you click on products or downloads, you don't see that many options. You see a much wider canvas for a lot more storytelling. Uh, you can't see uh, below the, the, the fold here, but you know, what you had there was a fat footer where you could get to any of the BG side, or the uh, business groups that you wanted to, any of the other products that you wanted to, uh, as well as other popular resources. So, Throwing fewer pebbles, making bigger waves, you know, is something that we've really kept um, close to. I mean, we've really followed that principle in a me very meaningful way this, uh, with this design. Disclosure drives action. So something else that we did um, with this homepage design was on June 29th, we actually, um, June 29th of this year, so just a few months ago, we actually shared this homepage to about 3% of our users. And it was very, very deliberate. We wanted to get feedback from a very small population of users to better understand you know, if they like this new design or not. And uh, suffice it to say, we were pleasantly surprised to see that you know, mainstream media also caught on to this. You, know, you saw a lot of um, influencers commenting about, you know, what our, um, about the new design on our homepage, including Forbes, even, including John Gruber, as you may or, not, may or may not know, is a big um, uh, influencer and, the, and, and a big Apple fan as well. So, it gave us an early indication that we were on the right track. It also gave us um, uh, a good sneak preview into um, uh, the kinds of issues that they might have, because we did get some comments back saying, hey, it would have been nice to do X, Y, and Z. We kind of evaluated that and concluded that some made sense, some did not. But that was part of what we, what we wanted to do when we exposed users to uh, the website early on. And then, of course, when we launched it in, on October 1, you know, a lot of those issues were attended to. And then it's getting to where the puck is going to be. So this is, you know, none of the top 15 websites out there have a responsive web, um, web design. And, uh, and that's a big deal. This is, you know, we're, when you think of Microsoft, it's not, you don't quite think of a, a, a company that is leading on website design. You know, yeah, we come up with really good software like we have with, you know, Office and Windows. Um, but you're starting to see us change quite a bit on this front. We, we want to get ahead of the curve. We really do. And we think that um, with online and online services, we actually have a massive opportunity. So nobody, eBay, 
Amazon, Facebook, Wikipedia, none of these guys have a website design that is uh, responsive today. And, and the beauty of this is that we are actually doing wonders for our customers because of the experience that they're seeing. It's a very seamless experience that they're seeing on their site. So what does this actually um, look like on the home page? So you see the home page. This is the desktop here. This is the tablet version. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the phone version. Let me just see if, if I have connectivity. There we go. Come on. I'm going to blame that on the internet connectivity and not on operational issues that we might be having. Um, OK, so it's loading. By the way, you see this pivot here for four home and four work. So you see three different highlights that pop up. Um, so. If you, let me just, oops, oh, hang on. So you'll notice that, um, hang on, okay, let me try this. <laughs> Darn. You'll notice that as I take this, this uh, uh, spread this out or, sh or change the size of this, the experience changes quite a bit. And let me. So again, when I shrink it down, if I can shrink it down. And this is closer to what you see on the phone. And that's exactly what website, I mean, but you don't quite see a lot of companies doing this today. And that's what I wanted to call out with this responsive web. One other thing about responsive web that I wanted to call out was how um, it, it's actually the mobile experience first that you worry about, not so much the desktop experience. Uh, if, you, if you actually design this for a phone first, uh, you're, you're actually, um, you're only building for one platform. You're not building for three different platforms. You're also optimizing for the mobile experience, which then translates to um, a different experience in the tablet and then the desktop. So at the end of the day, did this work? Was this a good thing or not? So you know, just like any other marketer, we want to know if this did work or not. So immediately when we launched this, we saw an improvement in click-through rate by around 20 25%, which is an awesome win. So it means that users are more engaged with, our con with the website. We saw satisfaction go up. 85% of people that we got feedback from on the new website uh, commented on the, the fact that they really like this. Um, and then not just that, we run a different survey with Comscore, and we've seen the scores for our overall experience and the way we've organized our content. The scores for that really haven't gone up. And then sales referrals went up quite a bit as well. Uh, we've seen, you know, on a, from a conversion standpoint, we've seen a lot more um, uh, traffic going to our store, and, and to be Honest, on that one front, a lot of that may be because of a lot of the noise that we've made with Surface and Windows 8. Uh, but in general, we've seen, even before they launched, we saw a lot more activity happening there. And then, of course, there's the, um, just the anecdotal, do people like it or not? And we got a lot of feedback, positive feedback, on if people thought that this was a good web website design or not. Um, and then, and then uh, you know, I, I want to is my final slide, I just want to pause and say, you know, there are tremendous benefits to a modern website, especially a responsive website, um, which actually uh, uh, customizes to the, which actually, uh, yeah, creates a customized experience for you on, a different form, on different formats. First of all, great customer experience for our customers and our users. Um, it's just completely seamless across all devices. Uh, very high performance in terms of load time, even though you didn't quite see that right now. But again, I'm not taking blame for that. Um, lower maintenance costs. You're managing one website. You're not managing three different websites. So it's much, much easier for you to do this. 
And then I think the most important one, I think for me and for us as a company, has been around perception. For us to be leaders in this kind of website architecture um, and for us to be known for that and for our users to actually think of us as being a leader in this front is, is a very, very important benefit for us. So that's all I had for you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take questions um, on res a responsive web or in general around how we did this. Uh, again, the seven marketing principles that I outlined earlier were probably one of the biggest, uh, were, were, were how we structured a lot of our thinking about arriving at the, uh, uh, as to how to arrive at the responsive web design. Thank you. Do you mind using the mic? So, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I was just wondering, how, do you, how, how did you guys convince the different BGs who are no longer going to be on the pivot on the homepage or have their products focused on the homepage to agree, knowing that they have the marketing budget and they still have goals to, that they need to achieve? Yeah, I mean, you know, I will tell you that this wasn't easy. I, I, and again, the question has to do with taking away and stripping off a lot of the components in the nav, um, so we're not talking about their products. And I, we get this email all the time, a, a, an email like that all the time, from multi-billion dollar business groups telling me that, hey, how dare you not have my link on there? And um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with what, what, uh, what we're doing in, in marketing, which is more like integrated storytelling, if the website cannot tell a story, then it's no point in having that. And even these people in the BGs are actually understanding that that's the purpose and that's the, the simplicity in design um, is, a, is a really important hallmark of, the, of, of this website. So a lot of it is education. A lot of it is cultural. It takes time. Um, a lot of it is a lot. I mean, it's just a lot of conversations that we have to have with them. And, and the last part is they actually understand a little bit more. You know, it's... it's when, when you see, when you compare it to, and again, this is what Apple has taught us really well, which is when you compare it to all these other uh, companies that, are, that, are, that have taken an approach which is more minimalistic and just more around storytelling, it makes it easier for us to talk to the BG partners or the business group partners and tell them to, that we're going to do a similar, take a similar approach. Yep, go ahead. Um, you mentioned lower maintenance, and I guess I'm a little confused because you still have um, three different states that you have to test for. You have the desktop, uh, smartphone, and tablet. So uh, it seems to be, and just in terms of your test matrix, it would be functionally equivalent to just pivoting on user agent and sending to a different version. Yeah, but you have to remember that you have to optimize. So. You know, one of the properties that we manage is a download center, mm -hmm. you know, which is if you are a, uh, if you bought an old Office product or a Windows OS, you know, there are things that you need to download over, over time. Does it make sense for us to be showing you the download center on the smartphone? Probably not. So um, it, there's, there's you, you have to optimize for content, but it's all done by one development team, and they're all integrated. So you share, you, you, instead of you having a mobile team, and then a tablet team, and then a desktop team, you're actually consolidating. Yes, the desktop team, or the, the one single team is going to be maybe a little bit bigger mm -hmm. because of all of these talk, the things that we need to consider on test options. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's going to be far more integrated. And I actually also think over time, your costs will go down. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is more of a first time setup type situation where you need to consider all of these options. But over time, your costs actually go down. Okay. Abe, uh, you mentioned earlier that you had launched this website in several different markets, and uh, I have done a lot of marketing across lots of different markets, and we've seen that there's been some significant differences in the layouts of the, the marketing that we're presenting in terms of how many links, how complicated the pages are laid out, the links in an email, and earlier yesterday there was in a session, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of growth in different markets uh, across these different platforms. Have you seen with the responsive uh, website development feedback negatively in the sense that they're, they're expecting more links, more engagement? Uh, I'm thinking of like APAC where 
they have uh, a lot of different links, a lot of different actions going on, and have you seen that this is accepted in, across multiple markets? Yeah, so um, I don't know how much of that has to do with responsive web as much as it has to do with having consistency across your, um, all of your properties. So Korea and Japan are known for having a lot, they actually pride themselves in having a lot of clutter, so to speak, on their websites because they think that that is how users um, uh, you know, navigate. They want a lot of options on the website. That's not quite how it is here or even in Western European countries. And if you go to India, they have this, they're very fond of having this yellow badge sort of constantly flashing. They think that, that attracts a lot of users. So every country is going to have its own nuanced situation what they're going to want. And we actually um, want to respect that. But at the same time, the trade-off is we need to have a consistent user experience for anybody who is a Microsoft user. So what we do is a lot of, we, we give some level of autonomy to the subsidiary that we're working with on what they want to have on their site. Um, but at the same time, we do you know, more centrally manage what is going to get on that website as well. So it's roughly an 80-20 split between what you can localize being, the localized being the 20% and then what we consistently want being 80%. A lot of our products are also very global in nature. It's not like you know, um, Windows 8 is only for one particular country or anything like that. It's actually a, a more, so the way we speak to all of these products um, and, and how we speak to them consistently is very important. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Hi. For advertising supported websites, is there an advantage to advertisers to use a responsive design site? Um, you know, I don't know the um, answer to that. I, th I want to say, say that creative sizing would need to be, um, there would be some work that needs to be done to optimize for a responsive website. But I know that in principle and theory, you could have one single creative that then automatically gets resized, um, whether it's a tablet or a, or a smartphone. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure as to how much more work it entails, but I do know that that's the spirit of what, what responsive web does. I have um, two questions. My first question was, you touched a little bit on um, seeing some results from the website and having uh, that converted in store. What type of uh, technology are you using to kind of track that engagement on site and then conversion in store? Uh, the conversion in store, just so we're clear, it's actually the online store. Oh, okay. So not the offline store. Um, so, uh, so we have a, a, our own homegrown sort of analytics that we use, and it's you know, across both of these things. But to, to answer your, but it, it's, yeah, I mean, it would be hard to kind of obviously track and, and, and see you know, what, how much of that activity on the homepage resulted in offline purchases. Okay. And my second question was, with this new re, um, responsive web design and the clean and the storytelling, how does um, offers and promotion play, uh, have a part within this new design? Um, offers and promotions in terms of like... In terms of if your device does uh, have a, you have a yeah. sale or so, something. So like what, 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 I, what I actually maybe glossed over a little bit is this notion of adaptive and uh, responsive is actually more to do with the layout. And while I realize that that's the way I've spoken to the entire presentation, what is also happening is, um, you know, coming up with content that's actually customized for your device. So that is something that needs to be thought through. You need a content strategy almost around what you're going to show when for what device. And that's, that, that, that also is attended to or that gets uh, expedited through the responsive web design, but it's not, um, it's, it's not one in isolation of the other. So responsive web is more to do with layout, but what we're also doing in Microsoft is actually thinking of adaptive content, content that is relevant. And for us, you know, we're not like a e-tail kind of thing where, you know, not like Starbucks where, oh, you're, you know, two blocks away from a Starbucks and here's a little coupon for you know, $1 off or anything like that. So for us, those kinds of very 
local environments or local scenarios are not something that's super relevant. I mean, store locations, I mean, we're actually expanding the footprint on our stores, physical stores, and um, having users know that there's a physical store nearby, that's important. Um, but we, we're not in that impulse category, which is probably um, a little bit of where some of these other websites are. So. Any other questions? Anybody, I'm, I'm curious, how many people have heard of responsive web, the responsive web? That's a good show of hands. Great. And any, any I mean, do you guys uh, use it with your clients if you're part of an agency? How is this landing with your clients? Is this something of interest to them? Do people understand it well enough? Is this a brand new paradigm and they're just saying no? I realize that I'm the one on the podium talking, but I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to get a little bit of discussion on that, because I am a little intrigued by um, how the community at large is viewing uh, the responsive web. I'd like to think that uh, there's a lot of traction, and based on the, the number of hands that went up, I think there is a lot of traction, but um, it does feel like the very early beginnings. It's very exciting that way. Go ahead. Um, I think a lot of people are curious to see kind of where applications. I want to just use the, phone, uh, the microphone. I think people are curious to see where applications fall in, whether they should take the time to create a responsive web, uh, site or create an application and stick with their website. And, um, OK. So there's a little bit of waiting, I think. OK. OK. All right. Well, if no other questions, thank you very much. Appreciate you spending the time.